Hello everyone, welcome to Leaf Line yet again, episode 6 if you can believe it, and I'm Brian Ralston, associate of the pastor. See, I even got that in, I remember it, I'm getting pretty good at that. So welcome back in, we're glad you're here. a two week streak. I know, I'm just getting the hang of that. So welcome back, and believe it or not, this is the 7th week we've been doing this, but we've only actually recorded 6 real podcasts, and one little tiny mini podcast. So we're glad you're still with us. Thank you for listening. And Ben Akeen is here, hey! physically distanced appropriately, and so is Rory, and all that good stuff. Hi. That's all I have to say for welcome. Isn't that great? See, I just got I'll, all I'll done. I'll say something. So gonna, I'm going to take a nap now. Ben's going to talk, and uh, well, I'll be back in like half an hour probably after Ben's done talking. Throughout this podcast, you're going to be hearing several opportunities for listener feedback. We love listener feedback. We don't get as much of it as we would like. If you've got listener feedback for it, the place is centenary1911 at gmail.com. Centenary1911 at gmail.com. And if you uh, ever can't quite hear that very well, then it is always in the description, which is posted below the video on the YouTubes. On to updates. Updates. Can I get an update? Can I get an update? So... The update of note today is that we are having to extend campus closure through the end of May. There will be no on-campus meetings, at least through the end of May. The uh, Centenary Ad Council got together on Monday evening, and in light of the governor's recommendations and his proposed four-stage plan for reopening the state, our church team also got together and started coming up with a plan, but Brian knows a lot more about that than I do. Yeah, so here we are at the end of April, and unfortunately, we're going to have to extend our suspension of what's going on here on campus. Uh, we have three working groups that have been formed by the Administrative Council to kind of work on getting us reopened and plans to get that going so we can be safe and help everybody stay healthy in the midst of as we can, as we're able to get going again. Uh, so we have three working groups starting. We have Ro Darnell's going to head up one with our preschool and trying to get our preschool restarted and how to go about that. Mark Vache is going to head up a working group that deals with the facility and how to keep, uh, how to do things differently with, with physical distancing and how to the, work on the cleanliness and hand sanitizer everywhere, all that fun stuff. So Mark Vache is going to be working on that with a bunch of help from, uh, volunteers and some of our staff and then the third group pastor bob's going to lead us and it's going to be the ministry restarting group because we know we're not going to be able to exactly start right where we left off in march and we'll have to continue some uh, church at home options and different ministry options even when we're able to get together because there'll be some that still aren't able to be with us uh, for various reasons uh, and also the size of our gatherings may be still limited when we get back together so that is happening. We're getting uh, going just to get a plan in place for when we're able to restart. And again, we're also waiting for our county. Uh, Stanislaw County is doing a really good job of getting a lot of guidelines for churches specifically. So that's coming out in the next few days. So that'll help us a lot when we get some uh, local guidance from our county. And again, the whole point of this is it is voluntary compliance, but we want to be subject and in submission to the government that God has put over us. And it's also for the safety of our congregation and health of our community. So we are trying to do the best we can to reopen as soon as we can, but also do it safely and wisely and carefully and in obedience as best we can. So more to come on that. We don't have an exact date, and I'm sorry for that. I wish we did, but that's the update on that area. So, again, you can reach out to Ro, Mark, Pastor Bob, or um, and myself if you have any questions or need some further clarification. Church so the ministry details. team will be... Uh, that will specifically cover, uh, among other things, also weekend services, yeah. Sunday services. And but you yes, could Pastor say Bob's that as far as Pastor Bob's team, everybody's working for the weekend. <laughs> uh, and one thing that I, I keep drawing out of this is patience is going to be difficult. You've all been stuck at home for a very long time. We're all eager to get back to life as normal. But even when we are able to reopen the campus, it won't all happen right away. We'll have to continue exercising that patience, continue exercising that discipline. It's hard for us here on, on Centenary Leadership as well. And these uh, online options that we've been creating are still going to be important even when things begin opening up again. So please, if any of you listening know somebody that might not have access to them, might have difficulty accessing them, email us, centenary1911 at gmail.com. Call the church office because if there's anybody that's not able to gain access to these, we really want them uh, to be able to be encouraged by them and learn from them and yada, yada. Brian. We'll figure out ways to do that. So if you do know of somebody that isn't tech savvy or isn't able to access them on the Internet, uh, just let us know. We'll figure out a way. We we have a lot of creativity and a lot of helpful volunteers that are willing to 
deliver uh, and to do different things like that. So let us know. And then Brian's personal rant, just for a moment, is oh. I'm getting really tired of all this, too, as most of you are. And I just wrote a little blog post that will be on the church website about how we can deal with this because I'm having a hard time. Uh, I'm getting weary of this as well. So my solution, prompted by a scripture, is to get my eyes back on Jesus. And as difficult as this time is, I think when our eyes get off of Jesus, that just makes it worse. And so for me, that's been my key lately. So I wrote about that recently. So... Shameless plug, but uh, it's Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, and it's just a short little re- writing on fixing our eyes on Jesus and how important that is right now, because I don't know about you, but I'm having a hard time with that, and my focus keeps slipping, and I keep getting distracted, and when I get distracted, I get crisis fatigue, and I'm just tired of all this, So, but there's nothing we can do, so there you go. Get your eyes back on Jesus. Back to Ben. Tie right over. Um, and if you would like to sing a song in that vein, Worship Everywhere Number 10 was just released on Wednesday, including Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. This concludes our 25-minute update section that has never gone this long before. Recommendations. Recommendations. Give it a try. Welcome to Recommendations. It's a new-ish segment. The first portion is What You're Reading, What You're Watching. For me, still continuing to slog through Pride and Prejudice and Deuteronomy. They're wonderful books, but I read slow and um, I've been enjoying one particular uh, YouTube channel since, well, I've been listening, to, watching it for years. I think it's wonderful. It's called Corridor Crew. There is a channel on YouTube called Corridor Digital that creates a lot of original content using their own VFX. It's all these really talented VFX artists that make their own crazy creative YouTube videos. They've also got a secondary channel called Corridor Crew, which has a lot of insights into the creative process. And I am a sucker for insights into the creative process because I'm a dork. Nerd, dork, both of those words. Ryan, what you reading? What you watching? You know, I have been enjoying, uh, still in my devotional life, uh, the Gospels, but I've also been spending a lot of time in Hebrews lately, and uh, so that's really been used by God. And then, uh, just for enjoyment, I've been reading a lot of fiction and just trying to get lost, uh, distract myself with some fiction books. Uh, a very weird one called The Rosie Project. Uh, caught my attention. It's 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 an interesting book. It is not a Christian book and does have some language, so I cannot recommend it because it definitely has some, some nasty well, language. Brian, I don't approve of nasty language. I know, Ben, but you're just much better than I am, so you know, I tolerate it sometimes. Uh, but, you know, that's been fun. And then Kathy and I have been watching through Parks and Recs, which is a comedy sitcom, uh, definitely not pure and holy, but it's enjoyable and makes us laugh and distracts us from all this COVID craziness. So that's what we've been watching during our... Uh, evening break time that's what we've been reading and what we've been watching now specific recommendations stuff we'd love for you to give it a try mine uh if you are one of the people that is stuck at home during quarantine and getting very very bored please watch the west wing if you have a netflix account the entire series is on there it's free and it's amazing you might say to yourself i'm not really interested in politics you know what i'm not interested in politics and i devoured the entire series because it's made by aaron sorkin he is a master of taking stuff i don't find interesting and making it spellbinding including the workings of the white house offices yeah and ben and i uh joked about this earlier because he stole my recommendation but that's okay uh kathy and i view the i west only wing. watched it because brian recommended it to me years ago <laughs> kathy and i view the west wing as our comfort food so we're just in the mood for something that uh distracts you from life a little bit it's a really well-written show incredibly uh well done uh obviously politics is always a little controversial but it makes you think and it's fun and so if you've never watched it get into it it's very enjoyable trivia so our trivia question last week was who was the left-handed judge in the book of Judges, and why is that significant? We had two correct answers. Joyce Yuziak, kudos to you, came up with the correct name. That name is Ehud, or Ehud. It hasn't been an actual name in thousands of years, so nobody knows how it's pronounced. It might be Hajaja. I say Ehud. It's just easier that way. Way to go, Joyce. And Randall Mom. Robinson also wrote in, and he wrote in not only with the correct name, but also the correct reason Randall wrote, the left-handed judge was named Ehud, and the significance seems to be that he could more easily carry and use a sword that was strapped to his right leg where fewer people would expect to find it. This advantage may have helped him in his successful attack on the king of Moab, from whom God was delivering the Israelites. Kudos to Randall and Joyce. New trivia question. We wanted to go back to a Bible question that you could find through research. And here is your question. What Bible character scored a major military victory 
using a mallet? This is a trick question. I hope you have the answer for us when we return to trivia next week. Main topic. Welcome to our main topic for the day. Brian has been very good in recent weeks about putting a disclaimer over everything, saying we're just having a discussion. We're not trying to convince you to see a certain way. I am going to go against that today. I am hoping to convince you of something. Uh, and if I don't convince you, maybe I'm wrong. I would like for you to email me and explain to me why I'm wrong. But I've got two very specific points that I'm trying to make today. Um, and today we are talking about something that historically in the church, not just right now, but for thousands of years, has been extremely divisive. It's a continuation of our discussion from last week about music in a church setting. And specifically today, we are talking about this thing that makes Brian groan, um, the division as it is seen between what is typically called contemporary worship music and what is typically called traditional worship music. Brian, do you have anything you want to say yeah. on this before I get going? Yeah, the the we can use the we pronoun. Ben and I are okay on this podcast uh, working together to convince you of a couple points. And the worship wars, as they're called, are divisive and silly and in many ways... Usually not helpful. Pointless. Yeah, not helpful at all. And and I I am one that grew up with hymns, and I love the hymns of the church that we know as hymns. Uh, they're sort of the ones that are in the hymnals. But I also love uh, and have loved modern and contemporary worship since I was a young pup, too. And I think there's a place for all of it. So we'll get into that in a minute. But go right ahead, Ben. Start so, us off. Before we get started, I want to give you a brief education in contemporary worship music. Unfortunately, it's probably not going to be all that grief. Did brief. we ever say what we want to convince them of? Uh, no, I'm going to say it at the end of this. Oh, story. okay, all right. Just make a brief joke. education in contemporary worship music will take us all the way back to the 8th century A.D. when Gregorian chant, which was monophonic, meaning melody only, was the way that people would conduct worship, and it was something that would bring the church together. Then in the 10th century A.D., something extremely divisive and controversial came in. It was not an electric guitar. It was a harmony. There was a time when harmonies were extremely controversial in the church because they were considered divisive. They were like, wait, we use our music to unite us. Now you're going to be dividing us in our music. It was so controversial, it didn't even take hold for 200 years. It took 200 years for that to become standard practice. But then... More changes happened. Contrapuntal harmonies, and then later in the 16th century, in the Reformation, Martin Luther did something that was extremely controversial. He chose to use music to teach doctrine to the people of Christendom, to the people of the church. This was controversial because, I mean, the, the regular folk were meant to be kept in ignorance so that the the state-run church could explain things to them and maintain its power. So for him to want to educate the masses was considered pretty controversial. Yeah, real quick, just it was almost as controversial, controversial as translating the scriptures. The Bible originally was never translated into a local because language. Because you couldn't trust the normal man with scripture. Exactly. You because needed You needed people. to have some laity, some... Uh, you couldn't, couldn't entrust it to the laity because you needed a clergy to sort of explain and invest you with the truth, you you as a lady person couldn't be trusted with it. Similarly in music, it was the same, where there was meant to be a separation. And Martin Luther and the other reformers shattered that, and they're also the ones that helped get Bible translations going, but also uh, brought theology and teaching and doctrine into music. And that was very controversial during the Reformation. By the way, in the later 16th century, uh, the scientific revolution took hold of the world. Worship at that time became intentionally a lot more emotional. Um, it still attempted to be doctrinal, but it, it brought human emotion into it in a way that hadn't really happened before because songwriters were responding to the colder, more clinical appraisal of creation that the scientific revolution provided. They were trying to restore what they felt had been lost, which was this search for beauty and a deeper meaning, and they did that through their worship. Controversial. And then we get to most people's favorite era of hymns, which is the 18th and 19th century. Amazing songwriters like John Newton, Fanny Crosby, Horatio Spafford, they brought a more visceral and personal movement in worship music, which was controversial. Charles Wesley was a big source of controversy, because where did he get his songs, Brian? He would take his tunes, the music, from bar songs. Heavens from, from forfend. Pubs. Pastor Bob always likes to, to remind us that Charles Wesley would take popular songs that men and women would have sung in the bars and the pubs and put them in with theology and, and biblical lyrics so that people would be familiar when they got saved. They could sing the songs because they knew the tunes already because they had been at the bars before they got saved. 
uh, music was still written in that style in the early 20th century, but as we the 20th century wears on, what we now consider contemporary worship music, stuff involving the guitar and drums, was launched largely because of a technological innovation, and that was the introduction of amplification. It provided greater possibility for subtlety and variety. You didn't need uh, as simple of a melody so that a bunch of people could carry it together. You could have one person leading it, and that person could inject a lot more, for better or worse, a lot more of their individual personality into the way a song was sung and performed in a church. One of the, the dangers of this uh, that we've even talked about last week is an over-personalization of our relationship with God, sometimes forgetting that God is holy, yada, yada. We talked about that. List. What's the point of us giving this history lesson? It's because I would love for us as a church to get away from the label of traditional or contemporary because those labels change throughout history literally every hundred years. And it's getting a lot more, uh, the, the intervals are getting a lot shorter now as, you know, just the world in general moves at a faster pace. But there is no such thing as traditional worship music. There is simply music that used to be contemporary at the time and honestly was groundbreaking and controversial when it first came out. Yeah, so if you've lived long enough, you know this to be true. When I was a pup, uh, I remember songs were controversial because they were Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, even the Gaithers were considered contemporary music, writing such crazy songs as Because He Lives and Thy Word. And and now you look in a hymnal and Because He Lives is, a, is viewed as a traditional Easter hymn and Thy Word by Michael W. Smith, sung by Amy Grant, is in the hymnal. But back in this, you know, 70s, 80s, those were the contemporary music of the day, and people in the traditional church music world would have never permitted that in their category, essentially. So I've lived long enough to see that happening, and it's happening faster and faster as technology and as the world has sped up, too. Maybe we're just picking nits here, but I think it's personally, it's really important for us to make that distinction because I have witnessed arguments in online forums before and I've seen, I read an article where a person kept saying this phrase. He was saying, what's wrong with the same hymns that we've been using for 2,000 years and that God has used to strengthen and edify the church? There's nothing wrong with hymns. The problem is they haven't been around for 2,000 years. Almost no song that we have is even older than a thousand years old. There's very few of those, um, and it's just it's just not correct. And also, the Bible is pretty clear that make a new uh, song, sing a new song to the Lord, is an okay thing to do. It's just you need to make sure that it's honoring to God, biblical, glorifying to God, all those type qualifications more so than when it was written. When it was written is only a historical fact. It's really not that important as far as should we be using it in the church or not. And that's not to say contemporary worship or what we now consider contemporary worship is correct and stuff in the hymnal is not useful anymore. It's it's all the same thing in a lot of really, really important ways. And I think if we let certain hymns be forgotten, then the church has lost something really valuable and important. But also if we shut out new things that are coming in and don't evaluate them on their scriptural content, um, then, then the church potentially loses something very, very precious as well. Yeah, that's why I've always been a big fan of sort of evaluating based on content and lyrics and singability and music and all those kind of criteria rather than traditional contemporary. I was part of a church in Illinois that would not allow anything, any hymns, any older uh, songs were not, not permitted in the worship. And that was, a, that was an extreme that was not healthy. And I think churches would go to the other extreme and just, uh, just no, nothing that's not a uh, traditional hymn and in a hymnal somewhere is allowed. I think that extreme is also unhealthy. I think the balance is in the middle somewhere. That's where we can get the richness and the diversity of musical uh, themes and music that's been written and lyrics. But the criteria should be biblical values, theology, singability, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, and we're not trying to convince anybody that doesn't like a certain type of worship to like that certain type of worship. Honestly, it's it's music. And people have very, very wildly different tastes. And honestly, I think if you're a contemporary person that hates traditional music, you're a traditional person that hates contemporary music, I think that's actually super fine. And I think there are valid reasons for a person to hate one style of worship or the other. Um, I think the most valid one is I don't like the way that sounds. I mean, music is a visceral thing. That's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful tool. But it's also, yeah, sometimes... 
sounds will make a person physically uncomfortable. I've spoken to people before that when a stick hits a drum, they just it they feel it on their skin. Yeah. And or you know, in the cases of people that uh, sometimes wear hearing implements, just something resonating at the wrong frequency will cause actual physical discomfort. Yeah. And I, I love the people that can personalize that and claim that and say confidently, that is too loud for me. That is unpleasant sound for me. It's not that it's an unpleasant sound in general. It's not that it's always too loud for every single human that's ever lived. It's just I love the maturity of saying that is too loud for me or that is unpleasant to me. Claim it. That's fine. Your opinion is valid and that is fine. Just don't don't project that opinion onto all of humanity and say this is wrong because it's it's always too loud for every single human. And I'll see the the uh, the whole personal taste thing, physical comfort can go opposite directions. I I know a guy that absolutely respects the canon of hymns that have preserved and and edified the church for hundreds of years. When he hears an organ, it makes him physically uncomfortable. Like he feels it rattling around in his skull the way he describes it. He didn't necessarily know that wasn't what everyone else you know, felt. And I think some people that get that physical discomfort don't necessarily understand that that is something that's not universal. You know, I don't think they necessarily realize this is my physical sensation and not other, other people are experiencing it this way. But yeah, long and short, I think it's totally fine to hate one style of worship music or the other. The problem comes when we try to limit other people's expressions of worship or say that this should not be allowed because of this one thing or the other or when we're in a worship service and we chose to we choose to withdraw from the worship because it is not in a musical style that I like honestly I think if if you're a believer you have a responsibility during a time of worship to glorify God somehow and if you can't glorify God through the music I think it's totally fine to very casually make your way to the back of the room, try and mitigate whatever sound is disturbing you, and and just find a quiet place in your head to worship God, even if you can't do it through the music. Brian, you're getting very quiet. To study the lyrics, to to take steps to make sure that you're still connecting with the Lord instead of slipping into critical mode and critical spirit mode and just... You know that that's an important step to do, and that's a that's a that's a I think a, a mature way to approach it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm quiet. I'm listening. I'm enjoying. So keep and, going. And it's very important to do this stuff to withdraw from the musical aspect of worship without a harumph, without folding the arms, because it's it's very very easy to make a physical display, maybe even an unintentional physical display. And it's a difficult responsibility that we have in that moment to be a mature believer and say this is not helping me to worship. I cannot worship. In this specific situation, I'm going to go stand outside and pray. And then I'll, I'll come back into into the sanctuary when the music is over. But to not turn it into some sort of symbolic gesture. Right. We, we as Christians need to remember we're not young children that get to go throw a tantrum when we don't get what we want. It's not about what we want or what we like. It's about what brings God glory, what brings people to know Christ, what brings people deeper into their relationship with Jesus. And so if at some particular point there is something going on that you particularly don't like or you it causes you physical pain even, there's ways to handle that with maturity that I think would really help the body of Christ. And considering uh, you're the stronger brother in that moment, you apply that concept from Romans of you choose to perhaps uh, go through a bit of suffering yourself so that others might be lifted up and brought closer to Jesus. And that mature attitude is 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 admirable to me. And I, I know that I am the contemporary worship guy at this church, and I worry that it sounds like I'm saying, if you don't like my music, then you're wrong, and you need to sit there and take it like an adult. Uh, I've seen this attitude that I'm describing of harumphing and arm folding. I've seen it from people when they approach traditional worship music as well. It's it's unhealthy. It's It's yeah. not building up the church. Regardless of where it comes from, regardless of who it comes from, it's not building up the church. Whether it's a young person, an older person, it doesn't matter. And again, age even. We have uh, older, wonderful saints of the church who love modern worship. And we have younger, uh, aged folks who love the hymns, the traditional hymns of the church. And so it's not an age thing either. And I've seen wonderful responses from many people in this church specifically that I just... People that don't like the way the music sounds, but still show tremendous support for the fact that it exists and knowledge that this isn't good for me, but this is encouraging somebody. Brian, you'd probably rather not mention any names, right? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's a yeah. We we could call out Karen Burhans, who I think you're thinking of, right? Karen Burhans loved our 9 a.m. worship service. It was too loud for her. It caused her physical discomfort. So she would stuff her ears full of Kleenex and sit in the front row. And she would engage, and she would be smiling the whole time. I miss Karen Burhan. She wanted to sit in the front row. She wanted to be present, and she loved it. And even though it was too loud for her personally, she made it work. And that was such an example of maturity and not to tease Karen, but, yeah, she, she really was an admirable person during all those years of the 9 o'clock service. We've got people that attend our 1030 service that hate the music I make but show such tremendous love and support for me as a minister at this church that that, oh, my gosh, that is tremendous. That The feeling that they have provides me with, the kind of uh, enthusiasm that I, I derive from that, it's... And I will not name names, but there is someone who attends the 1030 service that honestly does not personally care for choir music, but loves the attitude of the choir and the uh, the effort and the work ethic of the choir. And so they they love watching the choir because they're worship leaders and they're artists and they're musicians, uh, even though they personally don't care for choir music. So it's so interesting to me because, again, that's a mature attitude that says it's not about what I like or don't like. It's about what brings God glory and what brings other people closer to Jesus. And there is a, a ground or another avenue between all of these things that we're talking about. If you are physically uncomfortable during a, a type of worship, if you are just rankling internally at what's going on at the church in front of you, there is also a possibility that you're correct that the music that is happening, the worship that is happening has something wrong about it. And my encouragement to you is really pray hard about that. Seek scripture, find a theological foundation for what you are saying is an incorrect thing because there's a chance that you are presenting a viewpoint that leaders in a church have not considered. If you can bring them something from Scripture, if you can write a letter saying, I have concerns about the way music is being conducted here, I don't think it's building up the body of Christ, I don't think it's encouraging or training in righteousness this congregation, uh, there's a chance that you might be right, but you're not going to be right out of your personal taste and your personal feelings and emotion. Um, you know, none of us ever will be. Go to scripture and see if you can find something scriptural there that, that is speaking in contradiction to what we're doing in church. Because honestly, we need that voice. We need the, that kind of a congregation. Um, I've got one of those things that I've always felt very strongly about. Depending on where you attend a modern worship service, you might hear a guitar solo happening where the congregation is singing a song and then there's an instrumental interlude and the guitarist just rips a big impressive solo and nobody's singing anymore. I have a personal, very strong inclination against using exclusively performative music in a church setting. And I go to scripture for that. Um, and so, Brian, am I, am I yeah. doing this? So, yeah, no, you're, you're fine. So uh, read the scripture. But it's, yeah, and if you're not familiar with this, there is definitely that, uh, that and, there, and the person playing the instrument, it could be a, a, a piano, a keyboard. It could be a, a electric guitar is the usual one, but it could be drums. It could be all sorts of things. The person may be worshiping, and we know nothing about their personal motives. So we're not saying that. Definitely not. And even the worship team may be worshiping through those moments. But what's happening with the congregation is they're no longer able to participate because they're in an instrumental break, essentially. They where were participating in worship. They had an avenue yeah. to, to engage with that. They were singing. Now they're watching somebody else have an, a moment of worship. And I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in 9. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. Obviously, he's talking about speaking in tongues. I've always adapted this in my head to the way I approach church music. Uh, uh, continues in verse 10. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, or in my opinion, the sounds they're making on a guitar, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Right. I... I would never ask a congregation to attend church during a weekend service so that they could witness somebody else having a powerful moment of worship. I want them in that place so that they can engage with God in worship. 
Yeah, it's participatory and it's to build up the body of the church. And that's the point. And so bring God glory and build up the church. And so if you do have an instrumental break, there's sometimes that's useful for reflection. You put a scripture up on the screen. You ask people to Yeah, in that situation, the worship leader yeah. would have to provide an avenue for the congregation to engage. Right. So while that guitarist is ripping his solo... You put a scripture up on the screen and the worship leader says, pray this scripture in your heart right now. You know, speak it out to God from your soul. And, you know, so then everything's happening simultaneously. The guitarist is having his moment of worship. The, the congregation is not left out of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same page with that. And I think that's important in any genre of music, too, that it's, that it's participatory, it's bringing God glory, and it's to direct people to the Lord and to build up the church. Kind of the final point that we want to talk about today when it comes to this thing of what worship is good and what worship is not good. There's this thing that I've sometimes seen in these arguments, in these conversations, where I'll say we. We have difficulty separating our taste and our preference from what is theologically valuable. And that is something that we always have to keep our eyes completely wide open about. Uh, this is my wife. I was talking to her about this, and she actually brought me a a quote from C.S. Lewis that I was talking about. Should I read the whole thing, or should we paraphrase, Brian? Uh, paraphrase. Okay, so this is from C.S. Lewis. It's recorded in a book called Christian Christian Reflections. Among other things, he says, In your theological and ethical condemnation, you had better be very unsubtle. You had better reserve it for plain mortal sins and plain atheism and heresy. So C.S. Lewis is essentially saying, if you don't like a book... The way a Christian book is written, kind of, if you don't like the way a certain church does their worship, don't bring that to me. Don't waste my time with it unless you can find something from Scripture that points out this thing is wrong. Um, and, and I think that's something that we need to bring into our, our discussions about music in the church setting. I feel like I'm talking too much, Brian. You are, but that's okay. We're, we're used to it, and it's fine. Uh, this particular topic, it's been fired up, and so this is a Ben Heavy podcast, and that's a good thing. He needs to share, and I think it's valuable. But yeah, it's the idea that you, before you uh, launch a criticism or launch an attack, what is what is the basis of that that attack? What is the basis of that criticism? Is it your personal opinion and just sort of your your thoughts and your preferences? And unfortunately, even what you're familiar with is so often... What you're comfortable with is what what you think is right, and that's that's not always that's not always the way to go about it. In other words, use the Bible, use theology. Is this glorifying to God? Is this biblical? Is this theological? The argument that I'm making. That's what I have to figure out. And what's my purpose in bringing it up? Yeah. If it's just to run someone down or put my opinion forward, or just prove my point that prove my, my point. music is better. Right. And so often the loving choice is to sometimes uh, not uh, attack and choose to, to you know, extend grace instead of extending criticism. Uh, so when it comes to worship and music in general, what is your basis for your, you know, your, your attacks, your, your opinions? And we get very emotionally attached to music in a church setting. For some people, there are songs that they've been singing literally for 70 years that all throughout those seven years have been an encouragement and everything to them. And sometimes, you know, and music is very important to me. Certain songs that I grew up with uh, speak to me very powerfully, and I almost consider them as biblical in my heart. But it's very important to remember that God gave us a very, very powerful tool to use as a guide for our lives. And it wasn't a hymnal, and it wasn't a Chris Tomlin CD. It was the Bible. That's where we're supposed to go to. Right. And if songs draw you back to the Bible, and if songs encourage you in your biblical efforts and to draw closer to Jesus, then then great, revel in them, enjoy them. And if God uses special songs and they happen to be, you know, significant in your life, celebrate that, uh, enjoy that. But don't necessarily impose that on others and say this will uh, this will be an inerrant song equal with Scripture because yeah. it's not. It's not. It's maybe inspired by God in a different way, but it's not the same level as Scripture. Do you want to read more of the quote, or do you think it's enough? Oh, should I? I don't know. I stopped you, but... Yeah, let's, let's finish off more of C.S. Lewis, uh, continuing in that same paragraph. For our passions are always urging us in the opposite direction, and if we are not careful, criticism may become a mere excuse for taking revenge on books whose smell we dislike by erecting our temperamental antipathies into pseudo-moral judgments. 
Pseudo Moral Judgment. That at Clive Staples. That's a great band name, by the way, and so look for their forthcoming album. But C.S. Lewis I think is. I saw them open for Mastery. <laughs> C.S. Lewis is dense in his writing, but if you work through that, it's amazing because what he's saying is, don't let your opinions somehow be transformed into what you would call facts, and essentially use that to beat others over the head with. I mean, just just don't go there. Just understand they. That, that your uh, passions may get ignited, and you need to be careful with that because those aren't to be weapons that you use against others. And there's one weapon that you can bring into any argument that will always, may not help you win the argument, but it'll definitely help you walk away with a clear conscience. Bring some humility into that argument. There, I cannot overstate how important humility is in situations like this. And sometimes choosing to be silent is a great way to be humble, and just just don't, don't necessarily... F- you know, you don't need to talk necessarily or share your opinion all the time. So sometimes that's a very loving thing to do in certain sometimes situations. Sometimes wish Brian and I would take that advice. Indeed. So if you want us to take that advice, email us and we'll try to be. No, yeah. just kidding. Wrap it up? Sure. Okay, that's it for main topic. One last word before we go. Closing reminders. Uh, as always, please talk to us. Tell us what you like or don't like. Tell us that Ben should talk less. But tell us through centenary1911 at gmail.com. That email address is written in the description below this YouTube video. So I'll email that to Ben that he talks too much, but that's okay. Um, yeah, let us know you're listening and let us know your thoughts. We want to hear from you. And please take a look at centenarychurch.net slash wearecentenary. I'll put that link in the description below as well. Uh, we've gotten nine videos from congregants so far. I love seeing these things pop up. By the way, whoever you are, the church wants to hear from you. I, I worry that there are some people that might see this invitation or see this page and think, oh, I'm glad to see these people, but nobody wants to hear from me. Trust me, we do. Every single person that's been up there, I'm like, oh, good, this person sent one in. It's Because it's not about the quality. It's not about you saying something amazing. It's about you're part of our family, and we haven't seen each other in six weeks. Yeah, so we are Centenary recording video. If you need help technologically recording a video, let us know that. We can get someone to help you remotely even or even in a safe, uh, physically distanced way. We can get someone to help you. So don't let technology or your struggles with technology be a barrier. If you'd like to be a part of it, we want you to be a part of it. So let us know and we'll arrange some help. We're going to close out with a quotation, not from the Bible this week, but from a pastor named Alistair Begg. I love this guy. I love his observations, and I think his observation is particularly germane to our discussion today. It's not about worship style. It's about worship attitude. He writes, Every worship service should be a joyful celebration of the mighty acts of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is right for worship services to be dignified. It is not right for worship services to be dull. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes! Bye for now. Yours.